السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, good afternoon everybody. Uh, I am Hazan Abdul Azim, a specialist of pathology at Bahia Department, uh, pathology department at Bahia Foundation, uh, assistant lecturer of pathology, National Cancer Institute. Uh, thank you all for your generous participation in our first webinar hosted by pathology department at Bahia Center for Early Detection and Treatment of Breast Cancer. Uh, at first, I would like to thank our organizers and sponsors who facilitated this event that gave us the chance to meet together also the uh, current pandemic of COVID-19. Hope for all you the full safety and well-being. It's so much pleasure for us at Bahia Foundation and in a specific pathology department of Bahia Center to be the first and the only specialized breast pathology lab in our region. We are a more than five years of hard work and continuous effort to serve more than 5,000 cases with more than 12,000 of performance tests, tests uh, uh, per year, uh, covering almost all aspects of breast pathology services, including uh, cytology, pre-operative biopsy interpretation, post-operative reporting, diagnostic and prognostic immune chemical studies, and cytohybridization techniques beside our role in continuous medical education for our staff and for all pathology breast uh, interested pathologists. We are here today to launch our first webinar, hoping to cut short all the distances to deliver valuable content to you. And we are lucky today to have two brilliant and professional pathology consultants to do this job. Our webinar today will be about update of breast pathology and approach to diagnosis. First part will be uh, driven by uh, Professor Dr. Abir Shaban, consultant pathologist, professional clinical advisor at National Health System Breast Screening Program at Queen Elizabeth Hospital and University of Birmingham at United Kingdom. She will drive the first part of our uh, webinar today about P3 lesions of uncertain malignant potential, diagnosis, and management. Then, Dr. Ghada Mohammed Abdel Salam, pathology consultant and medical director of pathology department at the Haya Foundation. She will have the second part about, um, about uh, to, uh, to uh, answer a question about should non malignant breast lesions be removed from the background of the Haya experience? So let's welcome Professor Dr. Abir Shaban. Please grasp all your, all your attention and be with us. Dr. Abir. Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, hello. Yes, hello. Yeah, hi. Uh, good afternoon from Birmingham. I'll, um, can you give me the host function, please, to be able to share? You are now the host, Dr. Abi. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Okay, I hope you can see my slides okay now. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and uh, welcome from Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham in the UK. It's uh, just... Uh, past 12 noon at my end. So um, thank you for the kind introduction and it's a pleasure to be part of the first webinar of uh, Bahia Foundation. Uh, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, B3 lesions. Uh, these are lesions of uncertain malignant potential, difficult area in breast pathology, particularly for you if you're doing breast screening pathology. Um, and we'll talk about the diagnosis and management. Um, as you're aware, we um, assess all breast core biopsies and categorize them into five categories, from B1, which is the inadequate or normal, through to B2, which is um, the benign category, like fibroadenomas and cysts, for example, uh, through to B3, lesions of uncertain malignant potential, B4 are suspicious for malignancy and B5 are the straightforward cancers. And these are divided into B5A in cytocarcinoma and B5B invasive cancer. 
So today we're going to focus on the B3 lesions, and it is a heterogeneous group of lesions. So all these uh, on, uh, lesions on the slides belong to the B3 category. Flat epithelial atypia, atypical intraductal proliferation, or otherwise called ADH, atypical ductal hyperplasia, lobular carcinoma in situ, lobular neoplasias, including atypical lobular hyperplasia and in situ carcinoma, Papilloma with or without atypia, radial scar, fibroepithelial lesions where phyllodes uh, cannot be excluded, mucosil like lesions, and some other uncommon entities that fall under the B3 category, such as cell lesions, apocrine atypia, vascular lesions, myofibroblastomas, and others. So their histology is heterogeneous because they include lesions of variable significance. Some of them are completely benign, some uh, is associated with atypia. By definition, they are difficult to diagnose. So what's straightforward, benign is easy, cancer is easy, the bit in the middle is a bit challenging. And sometimes uh, immunohistochemistry is not helpful in confirming the diagnosis. For example, flat epithelial atypia. So these uh, are all morphological diagnoses. Most of them, if you sample more or if you excise them, will turn out to have a benign histology. So about um, 20 to 25% will turn out to be cancer. Some of these lesions are part of what we call the low nuclear grade neoplasia family. So for example, uh, columnar cell lesions, flat epithelial, atypia, ADH, are non-obligate precursors of breast cancer and can develop into low-grade DCIS and all these low-grade type of invasive breast cancer, like tubular, uh, myosinus, low-grade ductal, NST, and so on. This is different from the high-grade end, where it develops through a, another set of mutations and genetic abnormalities into high-grade to invasive high-grade cancer. So by definition, we would like to sample them to make sure that they are not associated with cancer. Uh, they are associated with low risk of subsequent breast cancer development, but this usually happens over a long period of time and usually uh, into the development of the good prognosis group of cancer, ER positive cancer. So it is important to adequately sample them to roll out coexisting malignancy. Um, and traditionally, this was done by diagnostic excision, so by surgical excision. It is important to know the significance of these lesions, what we call the upgrade rate. And what we mean by upgrade is the uh, possibility of finding in situ or invasive carcinoma if this lesion is further sampled or excised. And as you see, some of these are our own work, some are other colleagues' works, and the upgrade in general is uh, between 10 to over 20% of all B3 lesions. So what would tell us which lesion or why these lesions um, are going to be uh, developing into cancer? It depends on so many factors. Um, one of them is the uh, patient population. Uh, are these lesions presenting as screen detected cancer, so within a, a breast screening program or symptomatic? Method of biopsy as well. So needle core biopsy is a standard one, the small one, but we have other methods of sampling by vacuum assisted core biopsy, and these sample a larger uh, area of the lesion, and with this you're more likely to find any abnormality. The type of, of B3 lesion. So for example, atypical ductal hyperplasia is associated with the highest rate of subsequent uh, breast cancer identification. The size of the lesion, size, but um, the most important parameter that determines whether if you sample more, you find cancer or not, is the presence of atypia. And this is um, um, a large uh, study, observational studies looking at several, this is a systematic review, so um, 129 full te text studies, and found that the B3 upgrade rate in general is 17%, and that the atypical ductal proliferation 
or ADH has the highest risk of 28%. And this risk can be managed by what we call VAE or vacuum assisted excision. So you don't need to go for surgery. You can sample a bit more of this lesion by uh, radiologically by vacuum assisted excision. And in this uh, study, they uh, found that atypia is the strongest predictor of upgrade. So if you have on core biopsy, a lesion that shows cytological or architectural atypia, this is more worrying and this is more likely to have associated cancer if you sample further. So atypia is two types, cytological atypia only. So like what we get in a flat epithelial atypia where you have a single layer of atypical uh, epithelial cells and this cytological atypia can also be associated with architectural atypia. So when you have a micropapillary pattern uh, bridging uh, bar formation or early cribriform pattern, so this is the architectural atypia. Um, the more you do breast screening, the more you will see these lesions. And this is an example of flat epithelial atypia. So this is a dilated terminal duct lobular unit lined by a single or could be few layers of atypical epithelium. So why is atypical? Even at low power, they will appear very dark and hyperchromatic because of the high NC ratio. And um, if you look at the contour of the uh, inner lumina of them, you will find it regular. And this is a useful feature to differentiate it from columnar cell change that is non-atypical. You will see here that there is some apical uh, snouts and secretion, which are uh, characteristic of columnar cell lesions. So this is the current classification of columnar cell um, change. Um, and this is what we adopt uh, in the UK and in the WHO book, the latest edition and the one previously as well. So it is divided into columnar cell change without atypia. And that includes columnar cell change and columnar cell hyperplasia. So columnar cell lining, non-atypical, one or more layers, no architectural atypia and no cytological atypia. If you find cytological atypia, then you call it flat epithelial atypia or FEA. It's important to note that if you have associated architectural complexity, this is not FEA anymore, this is atypical ductal hyperplasia or DCIS, depending on the extent. This definition does not apply to low grade, uh, to high grade neoplasia. So if you have a single layer of high grade nuclei, you call this high grade flat DCIS, not flat epithelial atypia. So FEA by definition is low to intermediate grade nuclei and not high grade. Unfortunately, immunohistochemistry is not helpful in confirming atypia because columnar cell change, FEA, ADH, and cytocarcinoma all have the same profile. So this is to contrast. So this is columnar cell change. That's when there is no atypia. If you see the contour of the cells are irregular, can you see that the difference between the very regular FEA contour and, and this irregular one? If you look at the lining cells, nicely polarized columnar cells with epical snouts and secretions, you can have secretions or calcifications in the lumina. So this one does not have cytological or architectural atypia. It's benign, we call it columnar cell change. It can be associated with calcification and that's what we look for in the context of mammography and breast screening. Uh, so it is important to comment on its presence uh, other areas have the standard classical columnar cell change. What about flat epithelial atypia? How, how do we uh, diagnose this? Usually the nuclei are uniform and rounded. Uh, so instead of columnar, they become rounded or cuboidal and very much resemble the nuclei of low to intermediate grade DCIS. Sometimes you can get pleomorphism of nuclei, some variation in nuclear size and morphology, but this is not high grade. These are not big pleomorphic nuclei with prominent nucleoli and so on. 
Flat epithelial atypia had several terminologies, and if you look in the literature, there are lots of terminologies for it. The WHO book now accepts these further terminologies, columnar cell change with atypia or hyperplasia with atypia, and it is known to be a clonal proliferation of the terminal duct lobular units. Another example, can you see how these have now become the nuclei have become rounded, dark, hyperchromatic, but still have the uh, secretion of columnar cell snout. There is associated calcification with it as well, a bit of inflammatory reaction. All these terminologies were cited in the literature. They are not now recommended to describe flat epithelial atypia. So these terminologies are not now accepted to designate this entity. Sometimes on top of flat epithelial atypia, you start to get architectural complexity, micropapillary pattern in here. So this is now architectural abnormality, and that's when we call it ADH or atypical intraductal proliferation on top of flat epithelial atypia, and the cells, as you see, are again cytologically atypical. Another example of flat epithelial atypia with superimposed architectural atypia, so that's what we would call a typical ductal hyperplasia on top of it. It is partially involved, so it's not fully involved ducts, so qualify for the terminology of ADH. Uh, this is just um, a table to differentiate the architecture and cytology of the benign end, columnar cell change and columnar cell hyperplasia from uh, ADH and flat epithelial atypia. So once you get cytologically atypical nuclei, you are in the atypical area. Uh, cell layers can be variable in flat, although it is called flat, it doesn't strictly have to be flat, so you can allow some stratification. Uh, and you can allow some tufts, but not a complex architecture. Once you get a complex architecture, then this is um, ADH. How do we manage them? If it is on a core biopsy, you examine the cores at at least three levels. If all we find is columnar cell change without atypia, this is called B2, so that's completely benign. Nothing else needs to be done. If it is atypical, whether we call it flat epithelial atypia or atypical intraductal proliferation, so this is a B3 category, so this is atypia, and further tissue examination is required to look for any associated in situ or invasive cancer. And by the way, it is recommended not to use the terminology ADH on core biopsy because it is a quantitative term. So if you find the lesions that you would otherwise call ADH, but in a core biopsy, we call it atypical epithelial intraductal proliferation and await the full extent of the lesion to call it ADH or GCIS. If you have a flat lesion, with high-grade nuclei, this is not FEA, this is GCIS, and this is graded as B5A, so that's a malignant category. The uh, management of B3, there are lots of guidelines at the moment, so the UK um, has their own guidelines uh, published uh, in 2018 in detail. They are very similar to the American guidelines and European guidelines. And the gold standard now is to further sample by what we call second line VAP or vacuum assisted biopsy, sometimes also called VAE, vacuum assisted excision. So this is not by surgery, this is done by our radiologists and they basically use suction to take out um, a large amount of tissue to adequately sample it. The idea is not to completely remove the lesion, the idea is to sample it adequately to make sure there is no coexisting in situ or invasive carcinoma. And this pathway applies to all the lesions that um, are called B3, except a few. Uh, papilloma with atypia. So if you have a papillary lesion with um, cytological atypia or architectural atypia within it, we go for excision to assess the extent of atypia uh, because um, the extent determines whether you would call it ADH in, um, in papilloma or GCIS by the cutoff of three millimeters. 
So if you have more than three millimeters of atypia in a papilloma, that's DCIS. That's different from the standard two millimeter cutoff to differentiate between ADH and uh, DCIS. Uh, columnar cell lesions, uh, I will talk about them in detail. Other um, lesions that would go for excisions are fibroepithelial lesions. For example, you, you have a lesion and you're not sure whether it is a fibroadenoma or a phyllodes, a cellular fibroepithelial lesion. This needs to come out because you would like to assess the margin and the circumscription of the margin of the lesion. And other uncommon lesions like vascular lesions, for example, or spindle cell lesions, these need to be excised. If you find them in a columnar cell lesions in excision, with a tipia sample well, and uh, remember the concept of low nuclear grade lesions. Columnar cell lesions are usually associated with other lesions uh, like lobular neoplasia and tubular carcinoma. And this is uh, gathered together in what we call Rosen's triad. So Rosen came up with this, that these three categories are usually associated with each other. So if you uh, find one, look for the others. And this is an example of the low nuclear grade neoplasia family, uh, a lesion that encompasses all these parameters. So in one area, this is tubular cancer here. In another area, there is invasive lobular carcinoma. There is at one end low grade DCIS. There is LCIS lobular, and there is flat epithelial atypia. So you can get all of these uh, together. What do we know about flat epithelial atypia? We know that follow-up studies showed that they can progress, but at a very slow rate and in a small proportion of patients into uh, low-grade DCIS. And our study um, of a case control study looking at flat uh, epithelial atypia and columnar cell change, we found an increased risk for developing breast cancer in those patients. Molecular evidence flat epithelial atypia, ADH, lobulars, and tubular carcinomas share a common pathway of the low nuclear grade neoplasia family. Uh, and this is characterized by 16Q loss. And progression, as we said, is slow and uh, occurs over a long period of time. So what about ADH or atypical ductal hyperplasia? So that's a difficult diagnosis as well. Um, and it is a quantitative one. So this includes finding architectural and cytological atypia, not high grade, uh, and in uh, either two incompletely involved ductal spaces or less than two millimeters in size. If they are more than that, more than two millimeters, we designate it as DCIS in situ. And the B coding on a core biopsy is B3, if it is in a core biopsy, we call it atypical intraductal proliferation. What does it look like? A duct containing an intraductal proliferation of atypical cells with architectural atypia, in this case, micropapillary pattern, in this case, pribriform pattern. It's not extensive, it's just here involving one ductal space. So up to two is just ADH, more than that is DCIS. So atypia, two millimeters or two fully involved ductal spaces. Uh, however, if it is in a papilloma, as we've just said, the cutoff for DCIS is three, not two millimeters. Uh, this is data from the UK External Quality Assurance Program uh, for breast pathology. And um, in the UK, we receive slides to review every six months and every breast pathologist in the country needs to contribute to this. And we look at our consistency in the diagnosis of particular lesions. And as you see, the consistency uh, of diagnosis of atypical hyperplasia is not great. However, these are done on sections on actual glass slides. And sometimes when you cut through uh, a level and it is a focal lesion, you can miss it in one or more um, uh, slides. So that's, that's the issue with it. It's a very focal lesion. 
So management of ADH, so similar on core biopsy, you call it atypical intraductal proliferation B3. Um, the guidelines differ a bit on that. In the UK, we would go for vacuum-assisted excision as per the B3 uh, guidelines. Um, in other countries, they prefer to go for surgical excision for um, ADH because of the higher um, proportion of uh, cases that will be associated with cancer. Uh, in a surgical specimen, if you find it in one block, sample well and look for DCIS. Uh, it can be associated with it or can be an isolated event. If it is part of the DCIS and it is at the surgical margin, then you need to go back and clear the margin. So if we move to um, lobular carcinoma in situ uh, or LCIS, so this is mainly a disease of premenopausal women. We're all familiar with what it looks like, discohesive uh, cells, vagetoid spread may occur. We know that it can be multifocal uh, in the breast and can be bilateral. And the true incidence is difficult to assess. Uh, just to understand the spectrum of uh, lobular carcinoma in situ, uh, it's important to go back to the basics and know what the cellular component is. And um, classic LCIS can be either type A nuclei, like these cells, so very um, uniform uh, hyperchromatic cells with minimal cytoplasm, minimal variation in nuclear size and shape, a bit discohesive, and this in this case is involving and distending a terminal duct lobular unit. Compare this with type B lobular cells, where there is some variation in size and shape. It's a bit more cytoplasmic. You still see the intracytoplasmic vacuoles and discohesion. So these both are called classical DCI, uh, LCIS. Uh, remember that these are not high grade either. So these are low or intermediate grade nuclei. When do we call it atypical lobular hyperplasia? And when do we call it LCIS? So again, it is depending on the extent of the lesion. LCIS is a more established or prominent lesion where you have more than half of the SNI in a lobule distended and distorted by the characteristic discohesive lobular cells. If it is less than that, you call it atypical lobular hyperplasia or ALH. Uh, in the lobular category, there is no benign hyperplasia. So not like the uh, hyperplasia of usual type in the ductal type. There is no uh, benign hyperplasia in lobular. Hyper, if lobular new, uh, proliferation, it is always atypical. And then you differentiate between ALH and LCIS. Again, on core biopsy, you call it incytolobular neoplasia, and it is B3. So this is an example of ALH. Not all the SNI are distended by the characteristic lobular cells. So again, if you see this on a core biopsy, this is B3 ALH. We know that E. cadherin is a very useful marker in confirming the lobular phenotype. And this is particularly useful in difficult cases. So do not do it on every case if the morphology fits. Sometimes, like in this case, it is involving a big duct. And it might be difficult to differentiate between low-grade DCIS and LCIS. So ECA adherin is useful. And you have here a positive internal control of the myoepithelial cells. So this means that the staining has worked well. And this is a, a lobular proliferation. It doesn't really matter much whether you differentiate ALH from LCIS on core biopsy, because both are managed the same way and both are associated with the same uh, upgrade rate uh, to cancer. So LCIS can be multifocal and bilateral. Um, and um, tra traditionally, and there has been a lot of debate about whether lobular carcinoma in situ is a true precursor of breast cancer or just a marker of increased breast cancer risk. I think now we are more towards that it is a non-obligate precursor of breast cancer, um, and the identification of ALH is associated with uh, high, uh, upgrade rate uh, and also subsequent uh, development of breast cancer. So if you find it on core biopsy, call it B3. 
and go for vacuum assisted excision. If you find it in an excise sample, sample well. And um, if you find classic LCIS at the margin, we don't go back and excise. So we understand that it can be multifocal and bilateral, um, and it is of the classical type, so no further surgery needed. That's different from the other types and also different from DCIS. So if you find ductal carcinoma in situ at the margin, we need to go back and excise. Classic LCIS, no. But there are other variants of LCIS. Um, one of them is uncommon variant called pleomorphic LCIS or PLCIS. So what's pleomorphic LCIS? It looks very much similar to high-grade DCIS with it can be associated with comedonecrosis and calcification, as in this case. Why isn't this DCIS? Very similar, but you have a bit of discohesion here and some vacuoles there. And this should give you the clue that this could be um, in situ lobular, not ductal. This is another type of um, pleomorphic LCIS called pleomorphic apocrine LCIS. So it looks very much like apocrine high-grade DCIS. You can see it's high-grade big pleomorphic nuclei, strikingly pink and apocrine, lots of mitoses. Uh, so the presence of these high-grade nuclei, whether they are in ducts or lobules, would make it pleomorphic LCIS. How to know that it is lobular? Look for the discohesion and characteristic vacuoles of the uh, lobulars and do ecadherin immunohistochemistry. And this is an example of pleomorphic LCIS, ecadherin negative. As you see, it's worked in the myoepithelial cells. So this confirms the lobular phenotype. Um, lobular in situ carcinoma PLCIS can be ER negative. So while the classical LCIS is almost always ER positive, strongly positive, this is an example of a case where classical and pleomorphic LCIS are side by side, and you can see that it can be ER negative. In our experience, and, and we've published on that, most of PLCIS are actually ER positive, but a small proportion will be ER negative. The upgrade rate of lobular neoplasia in general varies in the literature. Overall, the classical is about a quarter of the cases. Pleomorphic is up to 60%. So if you identify PLCIS on a core biopsy, there is a high chance that there will be invasive cancer when you uh, sample more. Another even rarer variant of LCIS uh, that was uh, described in the previous WHO book and in the current WHO book is called florid LCIS. Uh, other terminology LCIS with comedonecrosis and mass forming LCIS. So what is this? This is a lobular proliferation that usually involves big ducts and it looks similar to low or intermediate grade DCIS. So the difference between this and PLCIS is that these are type A or B classical cells. They are not high grade pleomorphic cells. So these cells are distending ducts. There is, as you see here, necrosis and calcification, but this is not required in every case. And it can look very much like solid DCIS. Again, how, how to know it is uh, lobular and not ductal? Just suspect it, think of it first, because if you don't suspect it, you will make a diagnosis of DCIS. Um, and uh, if you see this case, we have a positive control of ductal epithelial cells and a negative intraductal proliferation. So this is uh, florid LCIS. It's not DCIS because it's ecadherin negative, and it's not PLCIS because it's not high-grade nuclei. This is another example, can be associated with calcification. So solid proliferation, neoplastic cells. This is not hyperplastic. This is a neoplastic proliferation suspected when you see this cohesion and do ecadherin. And this is another example, 
of florid LCIS. These are very, very rare cases, particularly in isolation. You may find them in association with invasive lobular cancer, but we see them separately as well. And if you do breast screening, you will come across these. If you're not aware of the entity, you will mistake them for DCIS. And this is an example of ECA adherent. Another marker that you can use similar to ECA adherent is beta catenin, and it, it shows the same thing. Basically, it's negative in lobular uh, carcinomas and positive in ductals. We don't know a lot about this, this lesion, but it has been described in the literature in small series. Probably the largest so far is uh, the one published by Maria. Uh, Pea Foxini et al. 2019, and they found that there is an association with cancer in approximately 40% of cases. Um, we did a study as well in the UK on 30 cases, and we found that uh, about over a 50% uh, association with in situ or invasive cancer, and when there is invasion, it's usually of the classical or pleomorphic type. So in general, how to manage LCIS? A lot of debate about what it is, what the entity is, is it precursor or marker of high risk? Um, and this is um, a really good study summarizing several uh, studies and looking at the guidelines in different um, countries and continents. Um, so for example, the NCCN guidelines in the US suggest excision with negative margins. Uh, for pleomorphic LCIS. The, um, in the UK, we treat as per high-grade DCIS, and these are the ESMO European guidelines. Uh, High-quality evidence is lacking. Uh, this is data from our multi-center audit in the UK um, of 179 PLCIS cases, found that it's associated with cancer in about 73% of cases, usually grade two lobulars, and it is ER positive, HER2 negative in the majority of cases. If you see it in isolation on core biopsy, it is, um, this is the upgrade rate. Um, several guidelines are different from us. The WHO book and the TNM does not regard it as in situ carcinoma anymore, but these are our, our guidelines. Um, and I think I am running out of time, so I'll stop at this and hand over to my colleagues. Thank you, Kavir. Uh, please give me the host back. Yeah. All right. Um, let me check how to do that. Um, how to give you this back? From, from participant, from a participant, you can okay. click on me. My name has no Razim, okay. and you can choose more uh, host. Okay, let me do that. Yeah, and make host. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Abir, for this informative session. Uh, the discuss the category really is a very problematic for all of us and very challenging. Uh, I hope after this seminar, it comes more to light for us. Uh, and I hope if there is uh, any surgeons or radiologists uh, with us here in this webinar, uh, uh, can give us all its cues to write uh, a typical uh, intra-epithelial prolective lesion and, and we can say, ADH or DCIS, low grade DCIS in the uh, biopsy material. Um, uh, thank you very much. It, it was very, very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, and due to our time issue, uh, we will postpone questions to end of the webinar after Dr. Gada. Uh, please, if you have any question, uh, our attendees, uh, please uh, write it now uh, uh, in the question and answer pan. Uh, and lecturers will answer these questions at the end of the webinar. Thank you all. Uh, and now, um, grant your attention to uh, listen to the, uh, the question answer uh, by Dr. Reda. Should non malignant breast lesions be removed uh, from the background of Bahia experience? Uh, and now, with Dr. Reda, Ahmed Abdesalam, consultant of pathology, 
and the head of pathology department at the hair foundation. Dr. Heather? Okay, yes, just give me a second. Um, okay, thank you very much, Hazel, for your kind uh, introduction. And I, firstly, I would like to thank Professor Dr. Adir for accepting the invitation today and to join our meeting. Um, it was really an informative talk from here. So I will start, give me a second to open my presentation. Yes, can you see it? Yes, yes, Dr. Okay. Okay. Just... So uh, my presentation today entitled uh, Should Non-Malignant Breast Lesions Be Removed? And I will present two cases from our uh, practice in Bahia Hospital. So the first case, uh, this is a female patient, 40 years old, 47 years old, presented to Bahia Center, complaining just uh, from right breast nostalgia. Uh, she is a premenopause woman and she is diabetic and married, but she has a strong positive family history for breast cancer. On examination, we found a right breast upper inner quadrant palpable area of probable adenosis. Uh, the overlying skin and nipple were normal and there were no uh, palpable axillary lymph node. First, our patient did sonomammographic study and on mammogram there was a right uh, breast upper inner quadrant suspicious area of microcalcifications. This microcalcification uh, occupying an area measured about six by four centimeter and this area extend towards the label and it was by I4, means suspicious lesion. So the plan was to take a true cut biopsy from this lesion. And the true cut biopsy were sent to our pathology department. And this is a scanned image for the whole slide for the core biopsy we received. And let's focus on these three areas. The first two areas actually show some dilated ducts um, lined by a single layer of uh, mildly atypical ductal epithelial cells with these epical snouts, as Dr. Abir said, and some of the ducts contain some um, secretions. In other area, we found this calcification, which corresponding to the finding on the mammal. This is benign calcification, luminal. So we made the diagnosis on biopsy as a flat epithelial atibial. So our patient underwent MRI and MRI uh, found bilateral widespread enhancing of foci appears on both breasts. However, it was more uh, numerous and sizable on the right upper inner quadrant. Uh, along the distribution of the mammographic defined calcification and also reached the nipple. However, um, these lesions or these foci show type one benign curve. So the question here, what shall we do to our patient? Shall we do excision or just do follow up? To answer this question, let's revise the risk indicators in our patient. First, the age, 47, which is a bit risky. The positive family history is a strong positive family history for breast cancer. The mammographic findings of these worrisome calcifications, as well as the important finding in the biopsy result, which was flat epithelial atibia. So the, the decision was taken for this patient to do wire localization and the excision of this suspicious area. After excision, we received the excised specimen in our pathology department and several sections were taken. And this is a scanned uh, slide for uh, microscopic examination. Let's see this tissue area. 
here and let's go for these two foci on both sides of this tissue. The first focus can tell us there is some uh, uh, residual area of flat epithelial atibia, while on the other hand, what about this focus? This is a focus of DCIS cripoform pattern of intermediate grade with central necrosis. So the thing here is that we found this DCIS in, com uh, in coexistent with flat epithelial atibia on the excised specimen. So the diagnosis uh, upgraded to DCIS of intermediate grade and the resection margin was free one centimeter. So we did hormonal uh, profile for the DCIS focus. It was strong posted to ER. So the plan of management for our case was to give her hormonal treatment and put her under a strict follow-up. However, five months later, the patient come to us and on mammographic follow-up, uh, uh, it revealed the uh, post-operative uh, operative beta change. However, there were still uh, retroareolar suspicious microcalcification appeared extending over an area of 3.6 times 2.3 centimeters. So what shall we do next for our patient? Let's revise the risk indicators. Beside all what we said before, we have a biopsy result of this of uh, flat epithelial atibia and the follow-up mammographic, which is show residual worrisome calcifications. And also don't forget that we have a DCIS on our previous excised specimen. So the plan was to do simple mastectomy and sentinel lymphinome biopsy. Simple mastectomy was received in our department and on sectioning, we found these areas. Let's go for a higher magnification to check what is it. What is it. So the first area showed features compatible with the diagnosis of flat epithelial atypia. But what about this complex area here? On higher magnification, we found an invasive carcinoma as well. So this is a low-grade invasive carcinoma uh, composed of angulated uh, or irregular distributed dots lined by low-grade atypical uh, malignant nuclei dispersed in the, this desmoblastic stroma. So the final diagnosis is invasive tumor carcinoma grade one, and the sentinel lymph node were all negative with free resection margin two millimeter. So we started with flat, just flat epithelial atibia on the biopsy, then flat epithelial with the DCIS, and finally on the excised breast, there was, there was an invasive carcinoma of low grade type. Hormonal profile for this invasive carcinoma uh, showed ERPR positive and HER2 negative with low KI labeling index about 5%. So the plan of further management for our patient was to continue on hormonal treatment and put the patient under strict follow-up, especially for the other breast. So what is the message from discussing our case today? Um, Actually, uh, the message we want to deliver is that once you find flat epithelial atibia, as Dr. Abir said in her presentation, that you should do further sampling by excision. So um, even if you have uh, flat epithelial atibia in your specimen, you should do further sectioning from your specimen because you may find a coexistent, more advanced disease that could have been missed in the diagnostic core biopsy. Also, excision is a strong favor for flat epithelial atibia, especially if there are some residual worrisome findings in the imaging or if the patient is already at high risk for developing breast cancer, and that was the case, uh, that was the uh, findings in our case. Frequently, you can find flat epithelial atibia with atypical ductal hyperplasia, and this uh, should um, and pathologist should, um, if, if pathologist found flat epithelial atibia in his biopsy or his specimen, he should do more sectioning 
and search for a concomitant atypical hyperplasia. Although some molecular data support that a possible rule for flat epithelial athebia to be a precursor for invasive carcinoma, however, there is no strong evidence that flat epithelial athebia is an independent precursor to breast cancer. And this risk is usually attributed to the association with atypical ductal hyperplasia or the association with DCIS. So our second case, this is a female patient presented to a Bahia Center. She is 45 years old, premenopausal woman with a weak positive family history for breast cancer. She is married and she is present and she presented to us by a left breast mass. On examination, we found this uh, breast mass on her left breast and with no type of axillary lymph node, the skin and nipple are were of normal appearance. Ultrasound examination was done for this patient and it revealed a well circumscribed hypoechoic oval mass with multiple cystic areas in the left uh, 11 o'clock position. This well defined mass, however, carries some worrisome um, findings like um, it has cystic areas. Also, um, there is an internal vascularity found on the mass. So it is not um, compatible with just fibroadenoma and they give it pyrite 4A. The decision made uh, is to take a biopsy from this mass and on microscopic examination, the score biopsy found, um, found to be biphasic tumor here, the microscopic examination, but if we go for high power, we will find this compatible with the diagnosis of fibroadenoma. However, in some foci here, we found this area of sclerosing adenosis. And here there is a cystic area. And this cyst uh, measured approximately more than three millimeter in the biopsy. Um, these two findings pushed up to uh, call it complex fibroadenoma, not just only uh, ordinary fibroadenoma. What about this focus here we found in the core biopsy? Here, uh, in a higher magnification, we found this atypical uh, interoductal proliferative uh, epithelial cells. So we call it the final diagnosis, complex fibroadenoma with focal atypical interoductal epithelial proliferation. So what shall we do for this mess? Can we do excision or just follow up? Let's go for the risk indicators we have. First, we have a biopsy diagnosis of complex fibroadenoma. And this increased the cancer risk 3.1 times that of normal population or in ordinary patient with fibroadenoma. Also, we have the positive family history, which further increase the cancer risk more to 3.7. Also, we have the association of atypical ductal hyperplasia or atypical interoductal proliferation uh, in associated with fibroadenoma, and this increased further the risk of cancer breast 3.8 times. And according to the guidelines, whenever uh, any patient uh, above 35 years and uh, she, had, uh, she has a mass which is not compatible with fibroadenoma, not by the, the radiologic findings or with the biopsy, so excision is recommended. So the diagnosis in our entity taken uh, to do wide local excision for this complex fibroadenoma. The excision received in the pathology department and sections were taken for microscopic examination. Here, this is a cross section of our fibroadenoma. You can see the well-defined mass 
However, you can see some complex features as we found in the biopsy. These cystic areas, more than three millimeter, and this is a higher magnification of one of the cysts. But what about this area here on the upper side? Let's go for a higher magnification to see what is it. Okay, we have here some foci of dilated ducts distended with this malignant epithelial cells. So we found here a DCIS involving this complex fibroadenoma, and here we can find some atypical ductal as well. This is another section of our fibroadenoma, and we can go for a higher magnification to see this area. Yes, it's also involved by low-grade DCIS. And we did some immunophenotyping to confirm the diagnosis. Um, P63 uh, for uh, myopsidial cells, it was positive at the periphery of the foci, while it's negative in the center of the lesion. ER here was uh, done as a diagnostic marker, not actually for uh, management. It shows a strong positive diffuse reaction in the DCIS component here. So the final diagnosis in our case uh, upon wide local excision was DCIS of low grade arising on top of complex fibroadenoma with no invasive component and with free resection margin 2.2 millimeter. Hormonal profile as we uh, saw before, ER was a strong positive. So the plan of treatment for this case was to give her hormonal treatment and to do radiotherapy. So the outcome of our case is to stress on uh, on few points, like in the pathology report, you should specify the histologic type of complex features found on the complex fibroadenoma and take care of presence of atypical hyperplasia in the biopsy. The risk of uh, breast cancer with complex fibroadenoma is associated with the degree of epithelial proliferation whether it is inside or at the periphery or adjacent to the fibroadenoma. Excision should be made when diagnosis of complex fibroadenoma, especially if it has a typical epithelial proliferation. Finally, I would like to thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reda. Uh, please give me the host back. Okay, just... Um. Really, thank you, Toreda, for uh, these uh, two striking cases. Uh, and really, the clinical, clinical, radiological, and the pathological correlation uh, is amazing and show us uh, the perfect and ideal practice, ideal practice in breast pathology. Uh, and for knowledge of all our attendees, uh, this is the everyday practice at Bahia Center for each case not only for interested cases, uh, which ensure a, a maximum diagnostic accuracy for our patients. Uh, and now for five minutes, uh, we will have a, a short rest, a short break, then we will resume with Dr. Abir and a very interesting slide seminar. Thank you. Please keep follow us. Thank you.
Dr. Rania Mahran is asking another question. The term microscopic malignancy can be applied when we have histopathological finding with no radiological correlates. Uh, I think the question asking about when we uh, give the term microscopic malignancy. Dr. Ada, if you can answer this question. Okay, I think it should be uh, straightforward if it is invasive. So you should uh, say invasive uh, carcinoma and give the measurements the size of the invasive tumor you found and put the stage. Uh, this is uh, the most important finding. Uh, you should write it down in your pathology report. If it is microinvasion, so it, you should write microinvasion. Microscopic finding, uh, I think it is not... Um, uh, a term, acceptable term in the pathology report. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Dr. Galen Ghali uh, about uh, also complex fiber adenoma. Uh, uh, is uh, when I say fiber adenoma, is it necessary to uh, that mean that uh, the presence of sclerosing adenosis uh, is uh, uh, necessary for, for uh, calling complex fiber adenoma? Yes, if uh, we found the sclerosing adenosis inside the fibroadenoma, so it will convert it to complex fibroadenoma. Yeah, but oh, yeah, yeah, it's necessary to find sclerosing fibroadenoma to call no. complex fibroadenoma, or uh, oh, there is another yeah. condition that we can call complex fibroadenoma without sclerosing adenosis? Not only sclerosing adenosis, of course. Uh -huh. If, uh, as I said before, sclerosing adenosis, cystic change, or uh, these findings, so it will make the diagnosis fiber complex fiber adenoma. Yeah, so uh, to be clear for Dr. Gerald Gary, uh, there is three conditions to call it a complex fiber adenoma, a cystic change for more than three millimeters, sclerosing adenosis or papillary endocrine uh, changes. Uh, so one of the, these three criteria, uh, if present okay. one or more, we can call it complex fiber adenoma. So yeah. if we found sclerosing adenoma, sclerosing adenosis, so it's complex fiber adenoma. Yes, no Dr. Ravi, this is yeah. Yes, no, no and the noses, but other features are present, yes. so uh, we can call it uh, complex fiber adenoma. As, as I think uh, Dr. Ravi uh, now uh, with uh, with us. Hi, can you? Yeah, I'm still not the host. If you can make me now the host, this should work. I'm afraid to make you a host again. <laughs> okay. There is uh, uh, the name Abir Shaban, but it's uh, written Abir Shanan. This is the one we. No, we no, no, that wouldn't be the right one. Oh, okay. oh is it? Yeah, Shanan, yeah, that's fine. Put that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not missing anything. Okay. Okay, now we are the host. Okay. Right, let me try now. Yes, finally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully, you will. You will see my screen. Right, can you see my screen now? So. Yes, Dr. Abir, you can see your screen. Right. right. Okay, right, I'll try to be as fast as I can then. Okay, outline of the slide seminar session. Um, We'll talk about histology differentials, approach to diagnosis, and role of immunohistochemistry. So case one, female aged 50 years, and this is post-neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So this is just to go, take you through the neoadjuvant chemotherapy and how we deal with these cases. I'm not sure how much you do of it, but this is um, an area of the tumor bed. So before we conclude that there is tumor or not, we have to identify the area of the previous tumor, where it was, and there is usually this reaction. And it's usually a lot of fibrosis, and you can see within it some inflammation, and you look higher, high power and do cytokeratin stains to look for any evidence of cancer. And out of all the tumor bed, there was only this residual carcinoma. So this tumor responded very, very well. Uh, this is a section of the axillary lymph node, which can also show the same appearance with fibrosis, hemocidrin, and reactive change. But there was a bit more of residual tumor in the lymph node. 
Um, and again, some within the center, there is fibrosis, very similar change to the breast. But what was interesting in this case is that the lymph node had a lot more tissue residual tumor than the breast, which has poorer prognosis. So this post-neoadjuvant residual tiny invasive carcinoma with nodal metastasis, in these cases, we need to confirm the presence of tumor bed, so see the reaction, size, grade, and margins of residual, the degree of response, how much of this tumor responded, um, number of positive nodes, in addition, any evidence of tumor regression in the lymph nodes. Sometimes you find no residual tumor, but you find evidence of fibrosis and reaction indicative of tumor response, which indicates that this was a positive node before treatment. These are tricky cases to deal with. We really need to have good clinical pathological information, thorough sampling. Uh, it might require specimen x-raying to identify the previous areas of tumor or calcification or clips. Uh, we need to be familiar with the post-chemotherapy changes in the tumor, in the nodes, in the lymph node, so they are time consuming. So at our end, before we look at any of these cases, we look up the previous imaging. Uh, if there is MRI done to assess response, a copy of specimen radiograph, a previous histology report, check what the original was. Was it one or multiple tumors, where it was, how the tumor responded radiologically? Sampling, sample extensively, a lot more than the standard. Uh, X-ray the specimen, so we, we have the option to X-ray and look for calcification, and we can use large or mega blocks. Anything that looks tumor, any tumor bed, anything that looks abnormal. How do we report these cases? There are several systems available. Um, the ones that we use and the, the ones that's most commonly used is the residual cancer burden calculator from the MD Anderson Center. And this is available online. So you basically get your parameters and plug them in uh, to get a formula. Uh, if there is residual tumor, type and grade so report it as usual, but always comment on the chemotherapy change and indicate the type of response. Is it pathological complete response, partial response, or no response? Definition of a pathological complete response is the absence of residual invasive carcinoma from the breast and lymph node. So no metastasis and no residual invasion. If there is only residual DCIS, this is also still regarded as complete pathological response. Uh, and this is um, a paper that describes fully how to deal with the, these specimens and um, the macroscopic and microscopic change if you want to uh, expand a bit more. So we guide treatment. We obviously provide ERPR HER2 status on the core biopsy to select patients and assess the change post neoadjuvant chemotherapy. As we saw before, you get some histological change indicative of response. So usually you get this degree of um, loose fibrosis, so not very dense, and you get atrophy of breast uh, um, glands and a lot of inflammation. You can get fibrosis in the middle, hypocellularity, and some degenerative changes in the epithelial cells. Uh, on lymph nodes, they undergo regression, and the tumor response in the lymph node often correlates with the primary tumor response. And lymph node status, positive or negative, or even with the presence of isolated tumor cells, is an important prognostic factor after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Next case, 55-year-old lady, uh, I4, so U4, suspicious speculative density um, in the breast. And this is a core biopsy from the axillary node. And as you see, so this is the, the lymph node uh, sections. And the, ideally, for the sentinel node, you would cut it at one to two millimeter intervals. So don't bisect the lymph node. Cut it uh, like bread slice it and look at it. And that's why we end up with several sections of the lymph node. From here, we can see that there is um, another population of more cytoplasmic cells, and this is a metastatic carcinoma in the lymph node. 
and this can be confirmed by cytokeratin, pan-cytokeratin immunohistochemistry. So this is cyto AE13 immunohistochemistry, and it highlighted a lot more than what we saw in H and E. So this is one section, and this is another section. So when we measure this, we need to go for the largest dimension. So if the largest dimension is in this plane, you measure that. If when you put the several slices together and add them up, they are largest in this dimension, that's what we use as well. So this is to highlight the um, cancer and sizing and role of immunohistochemistry. If you have a small metastatic cancer appearing in a lymph node, do further levels to get the largest size. Um, case three, I3, so uncertain density with calcification in the upper breast. Calcification is seen in sample on X-ray. So this is done for calcification and this is the excision specimen and this is the crowded area here that's what we will be zooming in to see as you see some ducts with intraductal proliferation and a lot of inflammation some smaller ductule there so a lot of inflammation which makes it a bit difficult to assess if we go a bit higher these are atypical cells um, variability in, in, in size and morphology, abnormal chromatin, early necrosis. It looks like it is within a duct rather than it is uh, invasive, but we need to confirm the presence of a myothelial layer, particularly when you have the dense inflammation. And you have these as well. Are these invasive foci or is it DCIS or involvement of lobules? As you see, there is cytological atypia mitosis. So this is clearly not a hyperplastic proliferation. This is smooth muscle mycin immunohistochemistry, and this highlights that there is a myoepithelial layer around the ducts and also around these uh, smaller glands that we saw this indicates that the lesion has extended to the lobules. So this is not invasion. This is what we call cancerization of lobules. So the DCIS is going into adjacent lobules as well, but all have surrounding myoepithelial layer. And you can confirm this as well by P63, as we saw in uh, Dr. Rada's case. So uh, nice nuclear staining, highlighting the uh, presence of myoepithelial cells. So this is high-grade DCIS with cancerization of lobules and comedonecrosis. There is no microinvasion or invasion. So we call it microinvasion if there is an invasion less than one millimeter in size. More than that, it's a true invasion. So always comment on the presence or absence of calcification and whether it is benign or malignant, because that's why the biopsy was taken for, um, and, and comment on the final histology. In cases of high-grade DCIS, particularly when they are confluent and there is a lot of inflammation, it can be really difficult to, to spot invasion. So go higher, you can do levels and do myoepithelial markers if required. We don't do them routinely, we do them when we find an area that we're suspicious about. Right, next case, this is a diagnostic excision of a B3 lesion. So B3 lesions, one of those that we have just talked about, and we have this architecture. So a bit of central fibroelastosis here, and then some radiating ducts. We need to go higher and assess the, um, these ducts. So the intraductal proliferation in here, there is um, a, almost a cribriform pattern atypical cells or so architecture and cytological atypia, but we also have these ducts which do not appear to have a surrounding myoepithelial layer. Although they look relatively uh, well differentiated, they go into fat as well, and there is associated fibrosis. Other areas look like they are within a duct and there is associated calcification so this is a, a case of a radial scar that had the architecture of a radial scar, central fibroelastosis and radiating ducts, but was associated with, um, so uh, these are the differential, the invasive ductal grade one carcinoma or tubular. When you see a stellate lesion, the benign end of it is a radial scar, 
the malignant and is, is it a tubular carcinoma or invasive ductal? So they can all have this uh, radial scar-like radiologically and um, histologically. So how to differentiate? The most important is to demonstrate the absence of myoepithelium. So if there is no associated myoepithelium, this is invasive. To look for the stroma reaction and to look for the epithelial atypia, although epithelial atypia and tubular carcinoma is usually mild, so this is not very helpful. In this case, we did P63 immunohistochemistry. These are residual normal ducts that are positive, and these are the glands that were distorted and irregular, completely lacking myoepithelial cells. So this was actually invasive carcinoma, grade one, uh, with DCIS. We didn't call it tubular carcinoma. It didn't have the full um, architecture of tubular because it had some solid areas as well. So it didn't fit with tubular. We called it no special type carcinoma grade one with DCIS. So what does radial scar look uh, like? The architecture is similar. So central fibroelastosis and radiating ducts, fibroelastotic stroma, there should be a preserved myoepithelium and no epithelial atypia. So this is what we should uh, look for. Myoepithelium is the most important and do myoepithelial marker uh, for it. SMM and P63 are the best and look for uh, cytological atypia. Right, um, next case, another B3 lesion. Um, this is what it looks like. So uh, this is something we need to all to be familiar with, this cystic architecture with um, histiocytic reaction um, and can be surrounded by fat necrosis. This is a marker clip reaction. So this is a radiological clip that is inserted by radiologists to mark the area of interest. We use this a lot in the context of breast screening and also in your adjuvant chemotherapy. At the beginning of treatment, we insert this clip in the tumor. So if the tumor responds completely or partially, we can still go back to the area of interest and sample. And that's what it looks like down the microscope. Uh, so we've got, we know that we've got the area of interest, but there is an area here as well that it's a bit cellular, not obvious at this power. If you go higher, you can see these um, cells that are not really that atypical, but they uh, are arranged in this filing pattern, so Indian file. There is associated few uh, ductules or lobules with similar cells with some discohesion. So this is lobular incytoneoplasia and invasive lobular carcinoma, a very small area. Um, if we go back, it was just this, this area very, very small. And the more screening you do, the more small lesions will, will, you will get and you will be dealing with very, very tiny abnormalities. So if you go higher, can you see the discohesion here? That's what tells you that this is uh, lobular and you can see some eccentric nuclei here as well. And then similar cells are seen in the background. It can be very hypocellular, very deceptive can look like inflammation sometimes. Um, and if you do e-cadherin, it is completely negative, And this confirms that this is invasive lobular carcinoma. It's a small area. And we always comment on the presence of a marker clip reaction to indicate that uh, we've got the right area. So this is an a lesion that was upgraded. Uh, it was in cytolobular neoplasia and then became um, invasive lobular and we confirm the area of interest. Um, we'll go through this quickly. Pre previous bilateral breast cancer, breast lesion, and exclude recurrence. So a lady had cancer before, now another area in the, in the same breast exclude recurrent carcinoma. Um, and this is what we have. This area is very pink, very fibroelastotic. So, um, and that's, that's important. And then you have these ducts that appear a bit hyperplastic and some um, uh, um, dilated ducts and some apocrine metaplasia. If you look at it, again, this is a, the normal arrangement that we were looking for radiating ducts, epithelial hyperplasia of usual type and apocrine metaplasia and microcysts. This is to contrast with DCIS. So the 
Epithelial hyperplasia of usual type usually have irregular slit-like peripheral uh, spaces. The, um, the cellular population is mixed, so you have luminal and basal-like cells, um, and that's what we have. So we didn't have any carcinoma, and this is just to differentiate between hyperplasia of usual type and DCIS. And in this case, you can do immunos to help. So basal cytokeratins like CK5, CK14, 5-6 are mixed in hyperplasia and negative in DCIS. Estrogen receptor usually mixed in hyperplasia and uniformly positive in DCIS. Please, can we see the H and E slide again? Yes, yeah, sure. Yeah, so this is the H and E. So this e, these were areas that looked uh, a bit hyperplastic. So introductal proliferation. So your differential will be: is it hyperplasia or is it ADH or DCIS? So even at low power. If this was DCIS, you wouldn't get these spaces at the periphery like this. You will get them regular, rounded, and throughout. So this is the first clue. When you look at the cells, there are some ovoid and rounded cells. And here's the same as well. While if this was DCIS, it would be just one population of cells. While these are mixed cells, some of them are uh, spindly and some of them are rounded. And that's what we pick up. And again, the same as well here slit-like spaces at the edge, and then a mixed population. And when we do immunohistochemistry, we try to show the mixed population in hyperplasia. So the mixed population, because you have some cells that are luminal, um, and these are ER positive, and some are basal, so these are ER negative, and the same as well with basal cytokeratins. So immunohistochemistry helps you because you get a mixed population in hyperplasia. While in DCIS, it's one neoplastic population. So CK5, CK14, um, CK56, all will be completely negative. And ER is strongly and uniformly positive. So this is an example of cytokeratin 5, 6, or 14. You have this mosaic pattern. So this is supportive of hyperplasia. If this was completely negative, you would be thinking DCIS. Again, this is ER, immunohistochemistry, a mixed population, some positive, some negative cells, and this supports hyperplasia. So this was actually a radial scar with epithelial hyperplasia of usual type and apocrine metaplasia. There is no evidence of recurrence carcinoma. Uh, so obviously radial scar is a difficult area. Hyperplasia of usual type is difficult. The diagnosis is benign versus malignant. So hyperplasia versus atypia. I know I'm out of time. Do you want me to carry on or uh, stop at this stage? And uh, go, go on. Uh, uh, how many cases are left? Um, I have I have three more, but uh, I can stop whenever you want. No, 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 no. These cases are very interesting. We can stay more. Okay. Right. So this is the next case. This is a wide local excision. And uh, these were enhancing nodules on MRI. So this lady had MRI that showed several nodules, and these were excised. And this is a low power view of, um, of the uh, lesion. Looks a bit busy and crowded, but we can't make much at this power. But if you look a bit higher, you can see that there are some here, there's some um, tubules infiltrating into fat. And in this area, you have a more of a diffuse proliferation of different cells. So this area looks a bit different from this, although they are side by side. And the rest of the breast shows some microcystic change. So high power, one area, normal ducts and the onion skin appearance and the this cohesive cells Indian filing pattern in one area. But in another area, you have tubules that are infiltrating into fat and appear to lack myoepithelial layer. We know that um, invasive lobular carcinomas generally do not contain tubules, except uh, of the tubular lobular type, which looks different. So we have like two components of uh, cells. And if you do e cadherin, the first component that looked lobular is actually e cadherin negative, and the other one that's ductal is e cadherin positive. So this can help. So we have 
a tumor that is of mixed type, no special type carcinoma and lobular carcinoma. E cadherin can be very helpful in these, but do not rely on it in to make the diagnosis. So lobular or ductal diagnosis, both are morphological based on the morphology. E cadherin can help in difficult cases, but do not change your diagnosis because of it. This It is nice in this case to highlight the two components, but even if you have some residual expression of e uh, about 10 to 15% of invasive lobular carcinomas show aberrant expression of e -cadherin. So you can get some cytoplasmic expression or some granularity. It's not completely lost. So don't make this change your mind if you think the morphology is typical of invasive lobular. Uh, as we said before, you can also use beta-catenin, which should stain exactly the same as e -cadherin. Next case, 78-year-old um, female uh, symptomatic breast lump. So here our um, um, breast screening program runs up to the age of 70 or 73. And so above that, the patient wouldn't be in breast screening. So in this case, the lady presented with symptomatic breast lump. And this is the lesion. So looks like some either ducts or nodules. Um, maybe a bit of necrosis here, it's a nodular pattern. Uh, a bit higher, a well-defined duct with uh, this uh, rosetting, I hope you can appreciate that. Some cells appear to be a bit streaming, like in here, and appear to be arranged around a, a papillary or thin <coughs> sinusoidal uh, um, pattern of cells. So almost a papillary pattern, but an organoid pattern. If we go a bit higher, can you see almost this rosetting of cells around some um, spaces? It's clearly atypical, some mitotic figures there. It is one population of cells also, the, although they, they vary, some of them look epithelioid, some look more spindly. Um, and then we did P6C3 immunochemistry to make sure that these are within ducts and uh, appears that the proliferation is within ductal space. And by the way, sometimes with DCIS, you get attenuation of the myoepithelium. You don't have to see a, a complete myoepithelial layer. If you see the majority staining, that's enough. And smooth muscle uh, myosin highlights the same as well, but also highlighting the thin-walled vascular channels within the proliferation, so almost a solid papillary pattern, so um, compressed sinusoidal uh, pattern here. I, um, I described um, spindling and, and uh, sinusoidal pattern and rosetting. These are all clues of the neuroendocrine differentiation. So if you see um, cells that are, are arranged in this way think neuroendocrine and do the stains. So we normally do at least two, synaptophysin and chromogranin, and they are both, um, as you see, strongly positive. So this confirms that this is actually neuroendocrine. So well-defined lesion surrounded by myoepithelium, solid neuroendocrine pattern, no invasion. So that's what we would call papillary neuroendocrine DCIS. The differential, a very, very close entity is a solid papillary carcinoma. So it can also be neuroendocrine, uh, it can be nodular, but uh, and is regarded as a variant of in situ carcinoma as well. But this is usually lacking myoepithelial layer. So solid papillary carcinoma in the current classification is part, is regarded as DCIS and managed as DCIS. Um, the characteristic appearance is a nodular pattern, usually one big mass rather than multiple, and usually lacks myoepithelium by smooth muscle uh, immunohistochemistry and usually shows neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, the other close entity as well is what we call encapsulated papillary carcinoma, and this is usually large cystic space with a, a well-defined uh, fibrovascular core, so proper papillary, not solid papillary, and again malignant, usually does not have neuroendocrine differentiation. Both of these are regarded as DCIS as well. So if you have this on core biopsy, either DCIS, solid papillary, or encapsulated papillary carcinoma, um, 
regard them as in situ disease B5A and always look for invasion. Sometimes on the excision, you find an area of invasion. You may have a big area of solid papillary carcinoma or GCIS, and then a small area of invasion. All the parameters, the sizing of the invasion, the TNM classification, all of it, ERPR testing should be done only on the small invasive. So, um, and you measure the whole thing as whole tumor size, but all the prognostic parameters are derived from the small invasion that's there. And that's why it is important to identify invasion um, and not only the DCIS and also comment on the margin status. Just to contrast, that's what solid papillary carcinoma would look like. So a big expansile nodule. If you look around it, usually there is no myoepithelium. And if you do myoepithelial markers, they will be absent. It has this characteristic solid papillary patterns, thin sinusoidal appearance. So not true papillary, compressed papillary. That's why we call it solid papillary. So uh, we, uh, in this case, this is all regarded as in situ and look for any evidence of true invasion. So see this lesion, there are some nodules going into fat and going into the stroma. So this is the bit that would be invasive. This is the area that you would measure and you measure the whole thing together as what we call whole tumor size. So solid papillary, this is the um, morphology, neuroendocrine differentiation, usually thin fibrovascular cores, usually well circumscribed. You can get pseudo rosettes and streaming. You can get mucinous differentiation within it as well. And it can be associated with invasive mucinous carcinoma, which also has neuroendocrine features. So the latest classification at the moment, the WHO 2019, described these entities under in situ uh, papillary lesion. And that we have to distinguish between in situ and invasive um, papillary lesions. Don't call it invasive unless you're absolutely certain it is invasive. So you need proper invasion. You need stroma reaction. What we call geographical jigsaw pattern, so irregular a nest rather than well-defined nest to call this invasive disease. And these are difficult cases and we get them in our secondary opinion practice because they are not easy to identify. Um, am I okay to carry on? Uh, this is the last case. Yeah, let's do this as the last okay. case, yeah. Okay. So 43 year old lady, she had a previous fibroadenoma excise and now there is a query recurrent lesion, and this is a core biopsy. So this is the uh, lesion, a very well-defined area. So you, uh, you can see why radiologically this can look like fibroadenoma. There is a myxoid stroma here, but there is a lot of cellularity, very cellular tumor. If you go higher, it's obviously um, a, a malignant lesion, very uh, atypical, lots of mitosis and high-grade nuclei. And in other areas, you, can, you have this uh, myxoid or um, mucoid background, and the tumor cells are forming a network uh, around them. So when you see um, a, a myxoid background, we have a differential. Could it be? Myxoid fibroadenoma could be, but this is not a fibroadenoma, it's malignant. If it is malignant, we would be thinking of, is it mucinous carcinoma? But mucinous carcinomas normally don't look like that and are not high grade. There are usually um, two types of it and, and the cellular type will have mucin in the background. Or the other differential is metaplastic matrix producing carcinoma. And this is one example of metaplastic carcinoma. If you do cytokeratins, uh, particularly basal cytokeratins, these are normally strongly positive. So they would come up positive with P63, CK14, CK5, because they are of the basal phenotype cancers. So this was a metaplastic carcinoma of what we call mesenchymal type, and it was grade three. So that's a current WHO classification of metaplastic carcinoma. All of these are of basal type, and all of these are subtypes of metaplastic. So it could be squamous cell carcinoma, pure in the breast, could be spindle cell, markedly atypical one, um, carcinoma with mesenchymal differentiation. So that's the mixoid 
chondroid, um, osteosarcoma-like, all of these would go under the mesenchymal differentiation. Low-grade adenosquamous carcinoma. So this is by definition a low-grade tumor with two components, glandular and squamous component. Fibromatosis-like carcinoma. So this is again a spindle cell cancer, but very bland looking. So it looks morphologically very bland, like fibromatosis of the breast. That's the difference between the spindle cell carcinoma, which is clearly malignant, and fibromatosis-like that looks uh, much blander and can be mistaken for benign spindle cell lesion. And you can get mixed population of any component. All of these would come up positive with basal cytokeratins, CK5, 14, and P63. Basal tumors, uh, usually pushing margin, central fibrosis, syncytial growth pattern. So these are the ones that we used to call before, for example, um, medullary carcinomas or medullary-like. They would go under uh, the basal phenotype as well, often triple negative. Um, shall I do this one or is that? Would you like to carry on with the last one or um, stop? Go at on, go on, go on, go on, Dr. Okay. We can't can stop, really, we can't stop. <laughs> okay. The 51 year old lady, history of breast cancer in the same quadrant. So she had breast cancer removed by wide local excision before, and she has a lesion in the same area. So obviously we would be thinking, is it a recurrent breast cancer or not? And this is a superficial lesion. You have the skin and then you have this cellular lesion there. If you look at it, the cells in places look a bit epithelioid, yeah? But in other areas, they look a bit spindly as well. And it is obviously cellular and very atypical looking. In other areas, it appears clearly infiltrating. So it's infiltrating into the dermis and around um, uh, ductal structures and, and around dermal structures as well. If you go higher, some areas are clearly uh, spindly, very abnormal chromatin, and see how big the nuclei are. So the, this is a malignant tumor. The differential is whether it is metastatic carcinoma or another complication of treatment, which is angiosarcoma because of radiotherapy. And for this case, because of the morphology, we did CD31 immunohistochemistry, which came back strongly positive. As you see, all these, and you can now see some more vascular channels. So angiosarcoma can look very epithelioid, can look uh, solid, can mimic carcinoma. But we need to think about it with any um, history of previous breast cancer, particularly if the patient received radiotherapy. So hi history of breast cancer, and this was a vasoformative lesion with marked atypia. So this was a secondary post irradiation angiosarcoma. So what's angiosarcoma? It can be either primary, very rare, or secondary, more common, following radiotherapy to the breast or chest wall. It can be well differentiated or poorly differentiated, and the poorly differentiated is the one that's difficult to distinguish from carcinoma, particularly with the epithelioid component. It can look very epithelioid. You can have blood lakes with frequent mitosis and necrosis. So the well-differentiated angiosarcoma can be mistaken for benign lesion, can look like scar tissue, pseudoangiomatous stromal hyperplasia, or benign vascular lesions. The poorly differentiated can, can mimic carcinoma, melanoma, sarcoma, spindle cell carcinoma. So always keep it in mind if you have a patient that had a history of breast cancer and received radiotherapy, even if it looks epithelioid. Okay, last one, definitely last, 47-year-old uh, lady, known breast cancer. She had a lobular breast cancer um, and uh, she had MRI. Normally, when we have a lobular cancer, we do MRI to look for other foci. And um, there was another suspicious focus that underwent vacuum-assisted biopsy. This was sent to me as a second opinion case. So it wasn't my case. Um, and... Um, this, these are cores of breast tissue. 
And as you see, there, are, there is a, this lesion here. Looks like a cribriform lesion at this power. Go a bit higher. Again, this cribriform architecture, very cellular proliferation there. There is, uh, doesn't look like there is invasive lobular carcinoma. And that's what it looks like, uh, higher power. So you have these um, secretions or uh, in places calcification. You have these well-defined uh, rounded spaces throughout. So that would make us think GCIS because it is rounded and uniform. And you have a solid proliferation in between. A bit higher, again, cribriform pattern. This, um, this structure like eosinophilic material here and these atypical cells there uh, um, enclosing the cribriform pattern. Um, so when I looked at this, it just um, did strike me that these cells are very discohesive. If you look here, you will see that the cells have lost touch with each other. They, they look more lobular than ductal here and there, is, uh, there are some intracytoplasmic vacuoles as well. If you go a bit higher, again, these are the cells. They are um, involving this structure, uh, quite cellular. There is calcification as well. And can you see in areas it looks very homogeneous and eosinophilic secretion in the middle. Another area, if you look at the cells here, again, lost touch with each other, discohesive. Uh, so you, you would be thinking, is it uh, DCIS, is it LCIS in a, in, a, in a different pattern, or is it adenoid cystic carcinoma, is it a cribriform carcinoma? So these are the differential, and, and it was sent to me as query um, adenoid cystic. Another area with a lot of this eosinophilic hyaline material in between. So this was the differential. My fa favorite differential was actually, is it collagenous ferulosis and involved by another atypical proliferation. Collagenous ferulosis is a benign entity and uh, it can look very much similar to cribriform DCIS. And if you do basal cytokeratins and uh, collagen-4, you can identify a population of positive cells. So this is collagen-4 immunohistochemistry that picks up this hyala. This is a CK14 that picks up the basal um, cells around this uh, material. If this was DCIS, you would expect this to be completely negative. You wouldn't get CK14 positivity at all. And then uh, this is a high power as well. And the neoplastic population is negative. So th the cells in between are negative. So these are atypical cells, but the, there is a population of positive cells there as well. e adherent is negative. So this confirms that this is actually lobular in situ carcinoma involving this lesion in a large duct. And this is e adherent again. So these are all, all these cells are negative. And this is collagen-4. So this confirmed that this is a basement membrane material. So these are not typical spaces or cribriform pattern. This is one of the features of collagenous ferulosis of the breast. And in this case, interestingly, it is involved by LCIS in situ carcinoma on top of collagenous ferulosis, and that's why it has this uh, cribriform pattern. So cribriform structure surrounded by myoepithelium, discohesive proliferation, CK14 and E adherent negative within the proliferation, and collagenous material confirmed by um, basement membrane like material by collagen 4. So this is LCIS involving collagenous ferulosis. So it's a potential uh, diagnostic pitfall because it can look like invasive cribriform, adenoid cystic carcinoma, or even DCIS. Uh, it is just in situ carcinoma. So this can be an incidental finding. We need to be aware of it to avoid making a diagnosis of DCIS, usually benign lesion. And lobular carcinoma has been reported actually to be associated with collagenous ferulosis in some case reports. Um, uh, so usually classical and you can confirm it by e adherent. Okay, so consider it in the differential, look for LCIS in the background and the monotonous proliferation 
with eosinophilic material. I think I will definitely, yeah, we'll stop at this and take any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Abir. Really, really uh, uh, pieces of jewelry uh, for these interesting cases. Uh, we have a lot of our colleagues from the surgical department uh, and thanks for, thanks for them for their patience. Uh, I hope you, uh, if, you, if you have time to answer some questions from uh, them. Yes, yes, with okay. pleasure. Yeah. Uh, let's start with the surgeon questions. Papillary carcinoma, uh, Dr. Yaral Ghali, uh, asking about papillary carcinoma treated surgically by wide local excision. Papillary carcinoma. Uh, and he is asking about uh, shall uh, they do uh, central lymph node or no central lymph node is needed? Yeah, so, yeah, so if you, if you call it a solid papillary, um, encapsulated papillary or papillary GCIS, wide local is enough. There is no indication to do sentinel lymph node biopsy because we regard it as GCIS. Uh, so we generally wouldn't do it. We, we generally even don't test for her, her too, for example, because we wouldn't give therapy. So treat it as GCIS. Okay, another question also from our surgeons. Uh, how can we estimate the margins of the lupus tumor? Uh, is the capsule only, uh, if the uh, capsule is the only margin, consider a margin uh, or the margin must be uh, extend beyond the capsule? Right. So this depends uh, what type of uh, phyllodes it is. So we divide them into benign, borderline, and malignant phyllodes tumor. The ones that we insist on a good margin for is the malignant phyllodes tumor. Um, there is no um, clear definition what this margin should be, but most authorities agree that it should be at least 10 millimeters of clear margin if you call it malignant phyllodes. If, if it is a benign phyllodes tumor, you don't need any margin. Basically, shell it out, inoculate it. The capsule is enough. If you take it out with the capsule, that's absolutely fine. Uh, borderline, again, we um, there are no clear guidelines, but it is preferable to have a clear margin for borderline. But for benign phyllodes, just similar to fibroadenoma, just excise it. If it is even present at the margin, we wouldn't go back or sample more. That's good. Uh, we have a question about this uh, lecture. Yes, this lecture will be uh, available on the uh, Bahia YouTube channel uh, for uh, more uh, revision and uh, sharing with other uh, colleagues. Uh, Dr. Ravir, another question. Uh, what is the value of uh, differentiating invasive liver carcinoma from invasive ductal carcinoma and uh, how it uh, will affect therapy? Uh, and what the indication of doing neuroendocrine markers uh, and how it will affect therapy? Sorry, the indication of what? Sorry? We have we have two questions. The first question is... Uh, how it is think, different. Uh, yeah. I, think, I think he's not a, not a pathologist for asking this question. He's asking what the value about reporting invasive carcinoma or invasive ductal carcinoma or next and what so on. Yeah. Uh, this will affect therapy or no? Yeah. So, yeah. So, particularly for lobular carcinomas, it is important to distinguish a lobular component because lobular carcinomas can be multifocal and bilateral. So you may actually, once you know that it is lobular, you would wish to look in the rest of the breast and in the other breast as well. Uh, and in the NICE guidelines, uh, patients who particularly want to have breast conserving surgery should be offered MRI to look for any foci of um, other invasive lobular carcinomas in the other breast or in the same breast. So that's the importance of identifying it. Another also important um, uh, consideration is like having a mixed phenotype is important to distinguish because one of them might be completely different in the biology and in the behavior from the other. So if we have two tumors that are different, we would test ER, PR, and HER2 for them. One of them might be HER2 positive and, and, and requires treatment, different treatment. Also when they metastasize, maybe just one clone of them will metastasize. So you need to be able to identify it at the very beginning to make sure that we, we capture that. So morphology, biology, and behavior can be different. Okay, another question. Uh, if there is a difference between a malignant and divine calcification, microcalcification, 
uh, it depends on which lesion they are associated with. So if, if the calcification is seen within a benign lesion or within normal ducts, we call it benign. If it is associated with DCIS or invasive cancer, so we call it malignant. Uh, but they look similar. There, there isn't anything to differentiate them um, apart from the associated lesion. Okay, uh, we have a question from uh, our pathology department uh, about uh, the, chemo the, the therapy assessment. Uh, which system is preferred to use, uh, Miller or MD Anderson? What, what uh, do you prefer? Yeah, so, so the UK guidelines say you can use whichever system you would like of, of the available systems as long as you state which one you use. The ones that I personally prefer and many of the breast pathologists here in the UK, particularly those involved in trials, use is the MD Anderson Center. And I think it has lots of, of advantages. First, it looks at the volume of the lesion, not only the size. So for example, you may have a very big tumor, but very hypocellular, so the volume of it is, is quite low. It is also the only system that gives you quantitative assessment, it gives you a number, and it has been shown to correlate very well with the outcome and is very reproducible. So personally, I would recommend the residual cancer burden calculator, easy as well to use, a bit more information than the standard, but uh, they are useful. The residual cancer burden is the gold standard for reporting new adjuvant uh, response in new adjuvant trials. So it shows you that this is the best for reporting for trials. So why would you use it for the trials and not and not for your standard care? Okay. Uh, another question uh, regarding the cases we received uh, for a post, post therapy. We received some cases uh, that received only hormonal preoperative hormonal treatment. Uh, 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 these cases uh, are, treat, are uh, uh, pathologically assessed according to Miller or MD Anderson or have another uh, way to assess uh, cases no. that receive only hormonal treatment? Right. This is a very good question. No, you cannot use these systems to assess post-neoadjuvant endocrine therapy because these systems have not been validated for it. Uh, there are no um, agreed systems yet for um, new adjuvant endocrine response. Uh, you mainly assess it uh, morphologically and um, comment on the size and cellularity. And in fact, we have a paper that has just been uh, accepted and should be published in histopathology on exactly that. What's the criteria to use uh, for uh, assessing new adjuvant endocrine response? There isn't much in the literature and, and um, um, our paper should be out soon. But uh, uh, I should uh, comment only about viability. Uh, oh, no? yeah. So you should look for evidence of response as well. So treat it like new adjuvant chemo. Most of the time you will find a residual disease. You rarely get a complete pathological response. So um, comment on the grade, on the size, the cellularity of the tumor, the lymph node, but do not put it into one of these systems because these systems um, um, Miller and Payne or, or uh, RCB are not validated for new adjuvant endocrine therapy. So it will be a descriptive report, put all this information there, but do not put them into a category, um, residual cancer burden class or, or, uh, or, or final number, you can't. Thank you. Uh, another question regarding the therapy. Uh, uh, as we see in uh, most, most uh, therapy cases, uh, there is downstaging for the tumors uh, in the breast from T3 to T2 or T2 to T1 or Tx and so on. What about lymph nodes? Can uh, lymph, uh, what about these lymph nodes that have uh, incomplete therapy response, but it turned from uh, macrometastasis to micrometastasis? Uh, how can I comment on this uh, uh, N-staging for these cases? Yeah. So. Uh... Uh, using the TNM staging, you always put the prefix Y before it. So this okay. indicates that it is after therapy and you size it as normal. So measure it. If it is a micrometastasis, put it as, as such and measure the size and also comment on the presence of evidence of tumor regression. However, you indicate that this is a post-treatment residual and this carries worse prognosis compared with a standard micrometastasis 
pre-treatment. So this is not regarded as complete response. In fact, the presence of any uh, residual carcinoma in the lymph node, even if, if it was isolated tumor cells, carries poor prognosis. And I think that this is uh, something that we need to discuss with our surgeons and the MDT team. So a micrometastasis or isolated tumor cells following treatment, that's a poor prognosis. Doesn't mean that the patient did well. In fact, most of the time using residual cancer burden, this comes uh, as class two, because this means it's a resistant clone that did not respond to treatment. Thank you. Uh, the last question, uh, I'm sorry for uh least too much questions. No, no, uh, not uh, the, uh, uh, the difference between uh, some cases of papillary epocrine hyperplasia and low-grade epocrine DCIS. And low-grade, sorry? Epocrine DCIS. Okay, right. So if you find an intraductal proliferation with neuroendocrine differentiation, this is not hyperplasia. So there is no hyperplasia that can express neuroendocrine markers. No, not neuroendocrine, epocrine, epocrine. Apocrine, oh yeah, apo apocrine, okay. So apocrine, um, hyperplasia and apocrine DCIS. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. So you apply the same criteria, but obviously apocrine cells are um, intrinsically different because they are big and they have prominent nucleoli. So you look for two things, architectural atypia, so is there a crib reform pattern, is a bridging, is a solid pattern and so on. So that's one. And then apocrine cytological atypia. So the apocrine atypia is different from the standard atypia and the definition is three times variation in nuclear size and morphology. So look for what you would call normal apocrine cell and compare your population intraductal apocrine proliferation with uh, the original. If, if the cell size is bigger by three times, and you can see obviously um, mitosis or, um, or um, pleomorphism and so on, this confirms atypia. Many um, uh, authorities prefer to see an area of comedonecrosis, for example, or so to confirm, particularly for the apocrine because they are difficult. Um, another um, helpful marker that you can use actually is HER2 immunohistochemistry. Most apocrine DCIS is high grade. So HER2 is usually positive in them. So if your differential is that, is it um, just papillary hyperplasia or DCIS and you did HER2 and HER2 is positive, this sways you towards DCIS and excludes hyperplasia. So planned looking cells uh, is uh, with uh, hyperplasia. Land yeah, before. yeah. So bland looking, before, no, before. no apocrine before. atypia. This is likely to be hyperplasia, and hyperplasia in the apocrine epithelium can be really complex. Can look papillary, can be micropapillary, can look almost cribriformy, but uh, the, there is no cytological atypia. But apocrine cytological atypia is different from the standard atypia in that you need to see three times uh, variation in nuclear size and shape. That's clear. Uh, thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Rabir. Uh, we have the honor to host you today in our webinar. Uh, I, uh, I'm very thankful for you and for all our attendees. And I'm sorry uh, for the technical error uh, occurred. No, not at all. I'm very sorry about this technical <laughs> glitch that happened. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that we sorted it at the end. And it has been a pleasure to be with you and to be with my colleagues from my own country uh, in a virtual meeting. You are, are welcome all the time. And we uh, are awaiting you uh, next year uh, to be with us here in Bahia. Uh, Bahia Center or in uh, any other uh, conference held by Bahia Foundation. Thank you very much, uh, dear Dr. Abir. Thank you, Dr. Leda. Thank you for all our attendees. And I announce that uh, this lecture will be uh, on Bahia channel on YouTube uh, for any reviews uh, and uh, for sharing with other colleagues. Thank you for our organizers. Thank you for our sponsors. Thank you for all. Hope you uh, a nice day and see you uh, uh, very soon in other events. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Rada. Thank, Thank you, for you very it. much. Thank you, Dr. Rada, and all the best to you and all the team in Bahia Foundation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a nice day. You too. Bye-bye.